Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me for today's edition of Arkansas Alive. All this week, we're talking about and teaching on a statement that Ben Franklin made to a woman after the Constitutional Convention was over, and she wanted to know what kind of government America was going to have. And he said, Madam, you have a republic if you can keep it. And that's what I'm talking about today, if you can keep it. And I'm contrasting it to the same thing that God told Adam in the Garden of Eden. He told him to dress it and keep it. So get your Bible. Stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. <clears throat> Let's go back to where we left off yesterday. Um, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. When, when God told Adam to dress and keep the garden, and I gave you a little history yesterday about the city of Eden. Uh, actually, by the Babylonians, it was called Eridu, E-R-I-D-U. It was excavated, oh, in the 1900s by the British and it's in the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford. You can see it there. There was a real city there, underground sewers, libraries. It wasn't cave dwellers. These were educated people. And uh, God planted the garden east of Eden, and he built the city of Eden, and he put man in the garden not to hoe and to pull the weeds. <laughs> I heard a preacher say one time, that all Adam was was a glorified weed puller. And I thought, a glorified weed puller? What does he mean? <laughs> there were no weeds in the garden. There was no curse. There was no, uh, no sin. There was, it, was, it was perfect. It was beautiful. It was created by God to be a beautiful a place of fellowship between Adam and God. And I read you some of the attributes of the garden that I got out of the uh, Haley Bible commentary, a textbook. Actually, I use it as to uh, describe things that happen uh, in those early days when God created the Garden of Eden. So Adam was not pulling weeds. And this brother that I was listening to at the time said, all, all happened, all that happened when man got born again, when man got saved, he just became a saved weed puller, a glorified weed puller. Well, there were no weeds in the garden until after Adam sinned. And then the curse came on everything. So Adam was not pulling weeds. He was, he was not hoeing and shucking and pulling weeds. That was not what God meant when he said, dress it and keep it. I mentioned to you the other day about my experience in Hawaii after many years of visiting there and vacationing there and preaching there and holding conferences and meetings there. I love the Hawaiian people, love the, the, the land, the, the beauty, uh, the peace, the tranquility. But if you go to the public beaches, they're not near as nice and beautiful as the beaches that are owned by the hotels and by the uh, landowners and entrepreneurs that are of course, making money. But the state beaches are rough and dirty and trashy, just like any public places in any other state. And so I, I noticed a difference. Every morning at daylight, actually before daylight, if you stay in a nice hotel, actually before daylight, uh, the gardeners are out there trimming the trees uh, trimming, uh, the, the, the mowing the grass. Uh, they're out there before the sun ever comes up and raking up the leaves that have fallen during the night. Dead flowers. You won't, if you go to a nice enough hotel, a five-star hotel, you won't see any dead flowers on the sidewalk. You won't see any dead birds or dead this or that. No, they clean it up. They keep it pretty. It's beautiful. It's manicured. It's the weed eaters are out there. The mowers are out there. It's, it, they're creating a, a uh, how would I say, they're creating 
<coughs> a uh, business here, and so they want it to, to look nice. But if you go down the road a few miles to the public beaches or parks, it's not the same. Well, what God was telling Adam, Adam, I'm going to create all this for you. It's, it's for you and Eve to enjoy. And I want you to dress it and keep it. Remember, our title is, If You Can Keep It. Now, you can apply this to any area of your life, if you can keep it. We can apply it to our nation, to America. We can apply it to the church. We can apply it to the world, if you can keep it. But what does that mean? When Ben Franklin told the woman from Philadelphia, if you can keep it, he wasn't talking about necessarily how the government works. He was talking about her involvement in the government. Uh, it's not only the consent of the governed. That's what a republic is, and that's what he said we had was a republic. It's not only the consent of the governed, but it's the active, informed involvement of the people. That's what Franklin meant when he said, if you can keep it. And God told Adam very similarly. He said, I want you to dress and keep this garden. So God created it. He built it. Then he turned it over to man to dress it and to keep it. Now let's define these two words. I think it'll help you. To dress, now listen to this, write it down if you want to. To dress means to set in order, take ownership of it. it it's, it's not just um, nail polish, <laughs> so to speak, not a good example. But he said, I want you to work this. I want you to set it in order. I want you to take dominion. The word keep means to guard, protect, to preserve, be faithful, to maintain. So God created the environment and the relationship, but he expected man to embellish it. He expected man to take the responsibility over what he had created and to keep it. There's the similarity. Dr. Ben Franklin told the woman, if you can keep it, if you can be involved in government, not just the consent of the governed, but actively informed and, and involved. So God told Adam, same thing, or actually told Adam, and then Franklin picked up on it. But God told Adam, he said, you got to take authority over all of my creation. Now, let's go to Psalm 8, and the psalmist asks the same question. Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you visit him. For you have made him, man, a little lower than the angels, and hath crowned him, man, with glory and honor. You made him, man, to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, under man's feet. All sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, fowl of the air, fish of the sea, whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So everything God created, he gave to man to take ownership of, to embellish, to make beautiful, to keep beautiful. I'm thinking of a, a scripture in Job in chapter 42. Uh, Job chapter 40. Well, let's see. It, it, well, it wasn't Job 42. It was before... 42. Let me go back to 38. Yeah, let's go back to Job 38. You know, Job was in a precarious situation. 
Job was being influenced by his miserable comforters that were telling him that all the trouble he was having was his fault <laughs> and it was, that God was trying to work out some mysterious purpose in their life to correct him. None of that was true. And God debunked that and exposed his miserable comforters and told them that they had spoken wrongly of him. But yet, you know, religion has gotten hold of that and they've adopted that uh, extreme God's sovereignty, or if you want to go ahead and call it what it is, Calvinism, fatalism, everything that happens to you is the will of God. That's not Bible. That's not true. But that's easier to adopt than that we have responsibility to take care of things. So in Job 38, the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Your words have no uh, life to them. They have no knowledge, no wisdom in them. Gird up your loins now like a man. I will demand of you and you answer me. And then he begins to interrogate Job. Listen to what he asks him. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? <laughs> you think you know so much, you're miserable comforters. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations uh, thereof fastened? Foundations of the world. What, what's, what's the foundation of the world fastened to? Who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. I've heard the stars singing. I have. I, I was uh, uh, on a moose hunt with some minister friends of mine up in the Northwest Territory in the Yukon. And, uh, you know, we were there in September and it was 32 degrees freezing. I mean, we had to break the ice off the stream so we could get our drinking water in the morning. That's how cold it was in September. Uh, the moose, the grizzly bear, uh, yeah, the caribou, everything up there. Um, thir uh, is uh, flourishing in, in that particular uh, atmosphere. And it was beautiful. And at night, of course, the night was, you know, you could, <laughs> it would be daylight up until 10 or 11 o'clock. And you could hear and you could see the northern lights. And there was an eerie sound. I know because I sat out by a lake. Uh, at, at night before I went in uh, the cabin to go to sleep and you could hear the stars singing. You could hear this eerie sound and you could see all of the colors of the northern lights flashing and swirling back and forth and you could hear these sounds, the songs, the stars were singing and God asked Job, said, where were you? Have you ever heard the stars singing together? <laughs> All the sons of God shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea with its doors? And when it broke forth, as if it had an issue out of the womb, he's talking about uh, the tides. He's talking about the waves. When I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a swaddling uh, band for it, and broke it up, by my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, listen to this, God's talking to the sea, and said, hitherto shall you come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed, stopped. So anytime you see any perversion of, of nature, ocean, Hurricanes, tornadoes, um, water spouts. Anytime you see tsunamis, anytime you see things like that, if you know the scriptures, you know that that's not God. God is not perverting what He created and set in order. Boy, there's a now. now uh, stay close to me here and listen. God told Job, he said, Job, I told the ocean, I told the seas how far they could go and they couldn't go any further. You know, he told uh, Noah, 
He said, I will never flood the earth again. So the rainbow was a sign of the covenant that God made with Noah. He would never destroy the earth with a flood. So if there is a flood, and just, you know, days ago we had floods <laughs> in all places like Las Vegas, and Palm Springs, in the desert. Uh, we had an earthquake in Los Angeles. I mean, you know, all the upheavals of nature. We had fires up in the Northwest, fires in Hawaii, and all of the upheavals. All those things are not God. God is not the author and the creator of destruction, of perversion. God set everything in order, all of the seasons, all of the winds, the water, the rain, everything. And when Jesus was out in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and a storm came up and it was filling the boat up and the disciples woke Jesus up and said, Master, we perish here. Are you not concerned about us? And Jesus stood up and rebuked the wind, rebuked the water, and said, peace, be still. What he was actually saying, according to Rick Renner, a Greek uh, authority, uh, Greek scholar, said Jesus was actually saying, shh, be quiet, be still. Isn't that what we say to our children, our babies? Shh, be still, be quiet. And if you research it further, he was actually saying to the wind and the waves, the storm, go back to the normal function for which God created you for. And it is not to steal, kill, and destroy. So anytime you see perversions of nature, it is not God. Now you can go over and read, um, and I'll flip over there real quick if I can find it real quick. Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Why, why are you seeing the fires, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the hurricanes? Why are you seeing all this destruction? The earth is in pain. In pain from what? Sin. Sin not only produced death in the humanity that God had creation, that God had created, but it's producing death in the earth. You know, the political whatevers and the investors and all that, they want to use climate change for an excuse for everything that's going on. Everything that happens, they're blaming it on climate change. When the founder of the Weather Channel, John Coleman, he said, there is no such thing as climate change. He said, that's all a hoax. It's for uh, research teams and people to get funded by the government if they will report on climate change and how it's the problem. Our problem is not fossil fuel. Our problem is not, uh, is not to make the world green. That, that is not the issue. The issue is sin. Sin is what perverts everything. We've got enough natural resources in the world, in the earth, even in America, coal, gas, oil, all those, quote, bad fossil fuels. We've got enough to, to provide energy for us uh, as long as the earth remains. God saw to that. He put all that in there. Now, it's not the fossil fuels and the automobile pollution that's destroying the earth. It's sin. Sin. It's, the Bible says the earth is groaning and in pain. That's what's causing all of the eruptions and so forth. So all we have to do is do what God told Adam. He said, I want you to dress and keep this garden, this beauty that I have provided for you. And it's not, you know, to, to, to keep the beauty is not to push man out of it and man is the problem. Man is the, uh, the creature that's destroying everything. It's, it's not, the solution is not the tree hugger. It's not to preserve the snail or the butterfly or the whatever that we're trying to. It's not to stop building or logging or coal mining. That's not the issue. The issue is to get man saved, to get man born again. 
and to get man to realize there, there is no such person as Mother Earth. Okay? It, Mother Earth is not God's wife. I know, know why people want to believe this stuff. Well, it's because they don't know the Bible. They don't know the Word of God. And they're believing some scientist or some creationist or some government you know, person that's trying to raise money. They, they don't understand what the Bible says. But Romans 8, 22, the whole earth create, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth until now. It's because it's in pain, the pain of sin. It's not God's judgment. God's not judging California by earthquakes and, and uh, hurricanes and so forth. We're, we do this to ourselves because of sin. And God was telling Job, where were you when I created the earth? Give me an answer. Where were you? How, did you hear this, the stars sing? Uh, did you hear the oceans go so far? The oceans can't go any further. If the oceans go any further and destroy, it's a perversion of nature. It's Satan that is perverting the normal plan of God. So when God told Adam, I want you to dress and keep this creation, he meant for man to take authority over the tormentor over the destroyer. That's who, who Satan is. He's the destroyer. He was, man was supposed to take authority over him. If Adam had done his job the way God intended, the minute the serpent showed up, Adam would have addressed him and spoken to him and said, be gone. Get out of this garden. This is the garden of God and you have no authority here. In the name of the God of the garden, and, and, and Lucifer would have had to leave and take the snake with him, the serpent with him. But Adam didn't do that. You can do that now because of Jesus. Jesus calmed the water. Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves. Jesus spoke to the fig tree. And you can do the same thing in his name. I've, I've spoken to tornadoes and wind spouts and uh, water spouts, all kinds of things uh, over the years when I learned this. And I've seen God protect people, protect me, protect uh, our home, etc. If you get enough people doing this, you can stop a lot of this destruction. And you don't have to, you know, pervert government and fund perverted projects and siphon them off into people's pockets and whatever. That's not how you do it. You don't have to send people to Washington and stuff. You stop it. That's what God was saying to Adam. You dress and keep this garden. I want you to take charge of it. So to dress means to work, to set in order, take ownership of it. That's another thing, and that's another message in its entirety, and I might deal with that on Labor Day, but <clears throat> the word dress means to work. <laughs> to work. What are we having problems with? The reason companies and restaurants and hotels and just going down the line, companies and factories, they're now calling, Google is now calling, uh, uh, or Amazon or big tech companies are calling their uh, people that were working from home for the last several years, said, come back to work. We need you in the office. That's what we originally agreed on, but we let you go home, work during the pandemic. We need you to come back. We need you to come back and take your uh, authority, take your responsibility. And, you know, people don't want to work. Or you wouldn't want to work either if you got paid for not working. Uh, or you, you cut your expenses so you can just, you know, you don't have as much financial demand on you, so you don't have to work. That was part of the dressing. And God told Adam, dress. I want you to work this garden. I want you to set it in order. Listen, I have gardened for years. I've expanded my garden until I just quit totally because of time. And, and the time that it took, but I finally decided, uh, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. But while I was doing it, you have to work that garden. You have to get out there and pull the weeds out of it because the earth is cursed. Now, the earth wasn't cursed in Adam's day. The, guard, the curse hadn't shown up yet. But to work this garden, they had to perfect things. They had to take care of things. You, you have to work a garden. You have to take care of your house, take care of your car. I tell you, so many of these things are intertwined. And our family, my father, even in, back in the 50s when I was growing up, 40s and 50s, 
I, you know, we had no knowledge of these things, but we just followed our grandparents' example every Saturday. Now, you're going to laugh at this, but every Saturday was wash day. <laughs> you washed your clothes, you washed your car, and you washed yourself. <laughs> Why? Because on Sunday, we're going to cease from our labor, and we're going to go to church, and we're going to be dressed in our nicest clothes. Our shoes are going to be shined. Our car is washed and cleaned and vacuumed, and we're going to honor the Lord. We're going to honor God. We're going to be clean. Our clothes are washed and pressed. I mean, whether we had revelation of what we were doing and why we were doing it or not, we still did it. <laughs> Some people say, well, I took a bath every Saturday night, whether I needed it or not. <laughs> it's, it's because they worked six days a week. And on the seventh day, they rested. They ceased from their labor. Well, God was, was telling Adam, Adam, he said, I want you to dress. I want you to work it. I want you to set it in order. I want you to take ownership of it. Nobody else will. He said for you to. And to keep, to guard, protect, to preserve, to be faithful, to maintain. You know, when we started a school, we started an academy for children from uh, uh, K-3 on up to the sixth grade. Uh, boy, I tell you what, we never ran into as many regulations as they have for schools. And now it's even more so uh, because of security. You can't leave doors open. You have to have cameras. You have to take ownership and you have to maintain. You have to keep the perverts out. You have to lock the doors and the windows, and you have to have cameras and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's part of keeping something. You keep the children safe. You guard, you protect, you preserve. That's what God was telling Adam. He said, I want you to dress, and I want you to keep this garden, this atmosphere. Okay, we'll continue with this tomorrow. Be sure and join me as we continue on our little theme, If you can keep it. And don't forget, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and wherever in the world you're watching, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.